this is his word unveiled we're back at it continuing in the book of numbers thank you for choosing to join me today and to walk through this this is an awesome chapter so much packed in here so we're not going to waste any time let's get to it our reading is numbers chapter 14 so if you can do that go meet with the lord there is so much in this so highlight write down um, just let it soak in your heart and don't lose sight of what the Lord is speaking. Don't lose sight of what he is doing, how fully capable, how good, how just, how holy he is. So you do that. Numbers chapter 14, that is our reading. Meet intentionally with the Lord. Let him speak. Let these words jump up off the page and do something in you, stirring incredible things up and truly changing your life, changing your perspective, changing your heart. Um, just let God happen in your life in this moment today. So Numbers chapter 14. Father, we thank you um, for your goodness, for your heart, for the way that you expose us and, and bring us to the light so that we are able to see you in your blessing. Father, I just pray that, that you strip everything out and off of me today so that you shine, so that you are glorified, so that you are magnified. Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to lead this conversation, lead this chapter, lead this teaching. Father, you take completely over. I pray that nothing comes out of my mouth that is not led by your Spirit. Nothing is, is thought of or spoken or done outside of what your Spirit, how your Spirit is leading me. Father, I pray above anything else um, that you are glorified through this time, that you are spoken of, that your truth is is revealed and, and brought to life so that we can be awakened to your truth, so that things in us can be changed and we can be drawn into you. Father, we need you. I need you to just shut me up and let the words that come out of my mouth be yours alone. May you be glorified through this time. In your name, amen. Okay, Numbers, chapter 14. So much to talk, so much to go over. Um, I just finished reading this, and I was like, wow. Like, I knew it was in it, but man, you know, when we just really read to learn, and read not saying, oh, I already know that, or oh, I know what happens, or oh, I know what takes place. We cannot go in with this mindset, uh, with that mindset. We have to read like, okay, I know this story, but show me something else. Show me something new. Let this be fresh. Let me see what's behind or what's underneath what was already underneath, underneath those layers, just a deeper perspective on this. So um, yeah, let's do this and let's, let's let his word be unveiled to us in this time. So Numbers chapter 14. So quick recap, our last video, the last chapter, Numbers 13, we saw that, that 12 spies were sent out to the land of Canaan. This is the land that the Lord said, I'm giving this to you. Go send spies into this land. There were 12, one of each tribe. And we saw that 10 of those leaders came back and said, okay, the fruit's amazing, food's incredible, but the people are huge and the walls are strong and, and we could seriously be killed, like, like eaten by these people, just like that. So they're putting the people down. People are getting fearful. They're getting anxious. They are by no means trusting the Lord and remembering, reflecting on what he has told them. But we saw that Caleb and Joshua, Caleb coming from the tribe of Judah, Joshua coming from the tribe of Ephraim, that they came in and said, no, by all means, let's take it. God's given this to us. Let's go in. Let's, why are we hesitating? Why are we even thinking not to do this? Um, so we saw just the separation in this. And even though Joshua and Caleb came in with that truth, the people still came back and said, no, seriously, like Anak and, and the Nephilim, the Amalekites, every, they're huge. They'll, they'll eat us up. And so that is how that last chapter ended with them bringing it about and, and magnifying the size of their enemies and choosing not to magnify the size of their God. So that takes us in then to our reading today in chapter 14. It starts off saying this, Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return 
to Egypt. Again, we saw this in the last chapter that because of this hardship, because they're consumed with fear, because they see someone that, that's bigger in size than they are, they start glorifying their past. It says in verse 4 that they said, let's appoint a leader so that he can lead us back into Egypt, so that we can go back into bondage. So this fear won't be here. They'll actually be living in fear. And sometimes we just get so focused in on, on the fear of something, if it happens, that people find themselves more comfortable and more at this fake sense of peace that, that they're better off just living in fear instead of fearing what could happen, what could be, what, what they see as is before them. Um, horrible. So we see all this complaining, this doubt, this fear that is consuming them and running their decisions and saying, we want to go back to our bondage. We don't want this freedom. We're, we're not believing that what God says with this, this promised land, that it's not for real, that these people are too big. This looks too hard. This seems absolutely impossible. This, this is just too fearful of a thing. And we see them just getting stuck um, in the rut of all of that. Then we see that Moses and Aaron, in verse 5 and 6, Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. They are grieving that the children of Israel are choosing to respond this way. And then we see in Joshua, that Joshua and Caleb, in verse 6, that they tore their clothes, that they are mourning, like, what is wrong with these people? And they speak up then, in verse 7, it says that Joshua and Caleb speak to the whole congregation, the sons of Israel, and they say, the land which we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. So they are bringing back what the Lord has spoken, that he is giving this to them, that this is their land that the Lord is blessing them with, within this covenant and blessing them, blessing their descendants, allowing them to be fruitful and multiply and giving them this land, which the Lord says is theirs. We see that they continue in verse nine. Um, Joshua and Caleb then continue speaking to the congregation saying, only do not re um, rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. We see this incredible sense of obedience and, and faith and fearing God and seeing in their saying, Look, this is going to lead us into blessing. We have got to trust the Lord. This is what the Lord spoke. And they are claiming their authority, saying their protection, everything that they have, their size, their strength, that's already been taken from them. It's been stripped from them. But they are so, the rest of the congregation is so consumed with doubt and seeing out of the, the lens of fear and out of the lens of doubt. But Joshua and Caleb continue and are persistent in speaking this truth into the situation. But the congregation won't have it. We see in verse 10 through um, a few verses where they get so roused up that they said, let's stone them with stones. These people are, are talking crap. They're going to lead us into this land and we're all going to die. So they're speaking the word, like the word of the Lord, what the Lord has spoken. And the congregation are like, nope, ain't having it. Like they need to go. They need to be gone. We, we want to be in fear. We want to remain anxious. We want to remain restless. We want to go back to our bondage. Can you hear just the absurdity of this? And how often do we get there when we don't want to believe because it's scary? And, and what we don't, what we're not getting is that in that fear, when we just walk in obedience, even when we don't understand, even when it seems hard, even when it hurts, even when we feel alone, whatever it is, that blessing is there. Blessing comes from that obedience and waiting and trusting on the Lord. But they say, let's just stone them. Then we see that God intervened with the glory of the Lord appeared, it said. And, and the Lord is just saying, how long will this people spurn me? How long? How many times will they reject me and continue complaining after I have shown them sign after sign and wonder after wonder and proving my faithfulness to them? How long will they be there? And the Lord just says, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kill them all off. I'm going to destroy them. And we see the humility in Moses where he says in verse 12, I will smite them with pestilence and dispossess them. And I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they. So God is saying, Moses, I'm going to make you greater. I'm going to make you better. I'm going to wipe them all out. I'm going to make you so great. Moses could have been like, yep, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's just me. And I'm going to get even stronger. I'm going to get even more powerful. But he doesn't. He goes to the Lord just as he did with Miriam, Miriam, his sister, as we saw in the last few chapters, where those who come against him, those who are making his life 
you know, miserable and discouraging and all of those things that he chooses to pray for them, pray that they be blessed, pray that they be healed, pray that they be restored. And we see Moses going to the Lord with this and pleading with the Lord and saying, God, you have done so many signs and wonders and the other nations, they see that. They know that you are the God of the Israelites, that you called them out, that you drew them out of bondage, that you told them you would take them into this land, that it would be theirs, that you would be their power, strength, and guidance. And Moses is saying, God, you said this. If you kill off your people, they're going to see this as you couldn't take them into the promised land, that you couldn't be a faithful God, that, that you're not as strong as you say you are. Moses is saying, show off God. Prove to these nations who you are and how good you are, how faithful you are. And I love in verse 18, Moses speaks this to the Lord. He says, The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. And why I love this is that this exact verse is spoken by God himself to Moses when they were up on Mount Sinai back in Exodus chapter 34, 6 and 7. The Lord speaks this of himself, saying, this is who I am. I am slow to anger. I am abundant and loving kindness. But then he comes and says, I will by no means clear the guilty. I won't that those consequences will be for real. So Moses is speaking. Moses is standing on the word of the Lord, what the Lord spoke of himself to him, and he's repeating that. He is saying, this is who you are, God. You spoke this to me about yourself, and I'm standing on this truth that this is who you are. I'm claiming this is who you are. I believe that this is who you are. And using that same phrase and saying, you're so merciful, yet you are just as real with consequences, just as real as these punishments and, and allowing people to understand what they're doing so that they can be healed, so that they can be redeemed and restored. And so we see that Moses is is speaking to the Lord in a sense of, hey, don't protect your people. This isn't about your people being saved or your people being whatever. This is about God being glorified. This is about God being who he is and him being magnified and seen and being made known that he is a faithful God, that he is a merciful God, that he is a just God, a holy, a holy God. Um, so good, just that interaction with Moses and the Lord. And the Lord responds to Moses, um, listening to him, that, that God hears us. God hears our prayers. Um, he pays attention. And in verse 20, it says, So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. But indeed, as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Surely all the men, and here is where the consequence is, where he says, I'm a merciful God, but these consequences are for real too. And here's where it comes, where God lays this out, saying, I should destroy this people, but I'm not. I'm listening to what you're saying, Moses. I'm going to keep them. I'm going to, to show grace and give mercy to them, but there has to be a consequence for this because I am a holy God. And in verse 22 and 23, it says, Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. So the Lord is saying, here is their consequence. Like, I'm going to keep them alive. I'm not going to just take them all out. But they will not be able to enter into this land that I have promised them. They won't. Because I made a covenant and they're not obeying. They are not doing their part in that. They are rejecting me. They are complaining. They are not trusting. They are not waiting. I mean, God lays out this is... This is what's going to happen, that they will not enter into this land that I am giving. In verse 24, it says, But my servant Caleb, because he has had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. So he is saying, okay, Caleb is different. And we see later on that Joshua as well. But Caleb, I love this, because he has had a different spirit. That word different, that, that, that Hebrew word, one of the words that define that is strange. And that takes me clear back to Aaron's sons when um, Nadab and Abihu offered that strange fire. That, that strange is what that word was in adulterated. And this is a different spirit. Yes, adulterated. This is, I'm sorry. 
Yes, yes, adulterated. So different spirit where God is saying, okay, Caleb is different. Caleb has this different spirit. Caleb has this different where it's strange, but in this sense, it's, okay, everyone's doing this. Everyone's complaining. Everyone's fearing. Everyone is, is choosing not to wait on the Lord and trust him and stand on his word. Caleb is breaking off and being um, being different. It's this strange. It's this foreign. It's not going with the flow. It's standing out and being set apart. That that different spirit is what is going to bring Caleb uh, bring blessing into Caleb's life that Caleb is able to enter into the land. That these other tribes, these these people that, that were alive, that saw these signs, they were not permitted to go into the land that the Lord said, this land is yours. Um, then the Lord just continues and says, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? And then he lays out what this consequence looks, that they can't enter the land, but what will come of them, what will happen. In verse 28, we see, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely do to you. So remember what they spoke. You know, oh, those times in Egypt, did God just bring us out here to die? They said, we're going to die out here in the wilderness? They weren't waiting or trusting on the Lord. Instead, they spoke their fears and their complaints, and they spoke them to life. God says, just as I heard you speaking, so I will surely do to you. And we see it follows into verse 29. Your corpses will fall in this wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me. Surely you shall not come into the land in which I which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. So, um, and then it says, Your children, however, whom you said would become a prey, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected. Guys, this is huge. So it says, Your corpses will fall in the wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward. So this whole idea of numbering the men, of seeing who is qualified for war, who in these tribes are ready for service, ready to fight, ready to be. 20 years and older, they numbered all of the tribes. So it says even your numbered um, your numbered men, all of those, all of those 20 and upward, all of those who, who the Lord mustered, brought together, appointed so that God would meet them, God would draw them personally into the wilderness to have that word spoken to them. Those all that were numbered, all that were appointed to be gods, all that were appointed to hear the word of the Lord speaking, all of those chose not to hear the word of the Lord, not to trust in the word of the Lord. They chose to grumble against the Lord. They chose to reject the word of the Lord. They were complaining. They were doubting. They were fearing. So those specific men that God appointed to live for him, to follow for him, to reap these incredible rewards of being blessed um, by, by entering into the land that God promised. Those exact men, those men will fall. Those men will die in the wilderness. Those men, their corpses will be laying in the wilderness, that they will die because of what they chose. They were choosing death over life. What God was offering them was life and life abundant in in the max amount of blessings, things that they couldn't even fathom and, and they couldn't even imagine coming into this land that God said is yours. But because of what they chose to reject that word, to not trust, to doubt, that the Lord says, just as you said, did you take me out here to die in the wilderness? That's exactly what is gonna happen to them. That they spoke those fears, complaints to life. And that is exactly what their fate would be. But the Lord said, everyone, 20 and older, you guys will die. But your kids, as they grow up, they will see. They will be able to enter into this land and they will know. They will see. They will They will learn to live um, in the blessings that I have established, ordained for them. And then he says again in verse 32, But as for you, your corpses will fall in this wilderness. Your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie in the wilderness. So we see this generational sin um, of consequences. That that for 40 years, so they spied the land of Canaan for 40 years. They were there spying. Then they came back, and these were their results. And all this complaining, all this, we're not good enough, they're too big, we're too scared, we don't want to listen, we don't want to trust, it seems too hard. 
all of this, that was 40 years. They came back and relayed these results from 40 years. So the Lord says, because of that time frame, 40 years is going to be the time that that your that your children, that your sons will be out in the wilderness for 40 years and they will be having to be stuck in the wilderness, be in the wilderness suffering from your unfaithfulness. That the generational sin, that that's for real. That that is for real. That that carries down that spirit of, of whatever it is, that spirit of doubt, that spirit of, of anger, that spirit of greed, that spirit of selfishness. Those things pass down. The generational sins are for real. But that does not doom us. That does not, that, that doesn't have to define our future. And we see this, that yes, they had to suffer for that amount of years because of their father's unfaithfulness, but they were given, um, they were given permission. They were given this invitation to then, after those 40 years, to enter into this promised land. Um, that's powerful. That's so powerful. Understanding, yes, the generational sins, that they're for real, the things that are passed down, that residue of evil, that can be passed down, but that does not seal our fate. That does not say, okay, we're bound for life, that we can speak up and we can choose. Though though maybe our, our fathers, our mothers, our grandparents, our ancestors, all of them chose to reject the word of the Lord, we have a choice. We may live with some of the sins, the struggles that we still deal with from that, but we have a choice in how we want to live. We have a choice whether or not we want to trust God and enter into that promised land. And when other people see see this, this strength and this overpowering that we will be crushed and destroyed, that we can choose to trust God and, and focus on the unseen and what the Lord says, listening, hearing what He speaks and trusting and being able to move in that in boldness and in confidence. Um. Okay, so then in verse 38, but Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh um, remained alive out of those men who went to spy out the land. When Moses spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people mourned greatly. So they heard, hey, this is what God's going to do. This, this is in verse 35, we see, I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they shall be destroyed and there they shall die. The people are hearing this word and they are mourning. They're mourning that they understand that only Joshua and Caleb are going to be the only ones living to enter into the promised land who are 20 years and up. And then, of course, these all of these men's children then will be able to move in with Joshua and Caleb. But obedience, that's obedience and remembering and trusting the Lord. That's where it gets you. It gets you entering into these blessings. It may take a while. It may not be easy, but it's simple. It's simple to just say, I choose to trust the Lord. No matter what everything else looks like, I'm choosing to trust Him. I'm choosing to follow Him in to the promised land that He has promised me. Then we see, so the people are just mourning. They're, they're just greatly mourning. They hear this word. They're like, oh my word, we're all going to die. We miss out on the promised land. Then we see in verse 40, in the morning, however... They rose up early, so all of the, the sons of Israel, after hearing this, their fate, pretty much, it says in the morning, they rose up early and went up to the ridge of the hill country, saying, Here we are. We have indeed sinned, but we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised. But Moses said, Why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord, when it will not succeed? So what they're saying is, okay, yep, we've sinned, we've sinned, we admit it, but now here we are, and we're gonna, we're ready to fight, and we're ready to go in, just like you told us, God. And Moses says, why are you doing this? The Lord said for you to go, you didn't listen. Then the Lord said, hey, you're gonna die in the wilderness, and you're not listening. Why are you doing this? But it says, um, let's see, Moses lays out the warning, even in verse 42. Do not go up, or you will be struck down before your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. You have turned your back on following the Lord and the Lord will not be with you. And here's their decision. They didn't trust him when God said, hey, I have blessings for you. And now they're not trusting him saying, hey, the blessings are stripped from you. You cannot have them. You cannot enter this land. They're saying, no, we want this. You know, we're, we're just going to go. We've sinned. Yeah, but now we're going to go. We changed our mind. We're ready. In verse 44, we see, um, their response to Moses saying, look, this isn't going to turn out well. God is not with you. God has spoken a word and you need to listen. You need to humble yourselves and listen. 
Verse 44 says, But they went up heedlessly to the ridge of the hill country. Neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses left the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and struck them and beat them down as far as Hormah. Um, that is a very unfortunate fate that the Lord laid this all out. You know, we see over and over again, they're rejecting, they're not listening. And there comes a time where they had, they, they had to repent. They had to humble themselves, accept their consequence because of the choices that they made. We have a choice. We, we have a choice as to how we want to live our lives. And we have a choice as to who we're going to trust, who we're going to listen to, whose voice we're going to listen to. Are we going to listen to the people that are complaining and being negative and bringing us down? The enemy's voice who tells us we're not good enough, that things are too strong, too big, too whatever. Are we going to listen to those voices? Or are we going to listen to the Lord when he promises, when he says, I've given you this land. I'm giving you this land. I have given you this land. This is the land that I'm giving you. This is the land that I'm going to bring you into. This is the land flowing with milk and honey. This is the land where my blessings are going to be poured out upon you. That no matter what their circumstances look like, they had a choice whether or not they wanted to trust the Lord, be focused on what the Lord said, be focused on the size of their God, or if they wanted to be so focused on what they saw. And, and on these, these circumstances that, that, of course, would just shrink them down in their fear and doubt and anxiety. We have a choice, and that's what it comes down to. And when the Lord says something and we reject it and we say, no, we don't want to follow, we don't want to do it for whatever reason then we have to accept the fact that when we say no to God, then we're saying no to blessings and we're saying no to peace and we're saying no to life. That's what we are saying no to. We have got to let that sink into our heart. If we don't, then we're going to be constantly just lightly, not even, not even thinking, not even, not even taking it for what it is, the, the, the profundity, the importance of what it is in, in obeying the Lord. And we're just going to think nothing of it to say, nope, God, don't really feel like it or nope, God, I'm a little too afraid, or nope, God, I don't really, you know, there's some other things that I want, or whatever it is. We have to understand that in our choice, we are choosing life or death. We are choosing blessing or the curse, this punishment for sin. And and just the, um, the, the ich of being outside of the presence of God. That's where life is. That's where blessing is. And, and we see that the congregation of Israel, they just... They just refused to trust God. They refused to wait on Him. And, and their fate was, was destructive. Their fate was, was not good. It was not pretty. And even when they tried to make it right, even when they tried to control the situation, they were still not heeding to the voice of the Lord. Um, may we just be convicted and challenged with that learning and growing in that. Let that just shape our, our minds and, and just how we think about things so that that helps us take God at his word and choose to trust him even when the situation looks like it's an impossibility. With God, all things are possible and we have to choose to trust him even when it looks like it's going to get nowhere. We have to trust him. We can trust him. He is faithful. He is absolutely faithful in everything at, at all times. Um, yeah, there was so much in that. There's so much more in that. Don't just take what I spoke. Just read through that again and let God just um, teach you more, reveal things to you more. There's so much more in that. But for the time being, that's what I'm going to leave you with. That's all we're going to hit. But I do, I encourage you to just keep seeking the Lord. Specifically on that chapter, let him continue speaking and heed to the voice of the Lord. Trust his voice. And when he speaks something, you hold on. You let it you let it penetrate your heart, you let it sink into your heart, you let it shape your heart, you let it surround you and carry you through into every step forward of obedience, believing that, um, that the promised land, that our promised land, though it may look scary at first, oh my goodness, it's so worth it. What he has in store, what he has in store for us. And those blessings come from our obedience, from our listening to him, from our remembering who he is, how great he is, and, and believing, truly believing that he is capable, that he is a God who is able to do all things. May we wait, may we trust, may we believe in him and believe him, taking him at his word. 
That's all I have for you today. I'm going to leave you with that. Um, so excited for more. This, this is just the beginning. God is just teaching and speaking, and may he continue to do so. Um, I'm praying that you just keep coming back and that we keep walking this out together, growing together, doing life together, and letting God be glorified. Letting God just take us on incredible adventures with him in his presence, wrapped up, empowered. Let's do this. Let's keep doing this together. Thanks for joining me. Um, hope to see you soon.